Are you seeing? Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. Well, you're going to have to stay there, lady. Yeah, you're going to have to stay up front with me. Because when I'm done, you're going to hit that standby again. All right. Okay. Um, this morning, I want to take a look at a subject that I know that we battle on a daily basis. There are many of us this morning, many of you that are going through uh, what I call fighting for an awesome family. Fighting to keep your family, fighting to pray over your family. And so the scripture reference that we read this morning is taken out of Nehemiah chapter 4. Now remember the last time I was here, we, talk, we spoke to you on the look at marriage, what marriage looks like and how to fight for that marriage. And today we're going to talk about fighting for an awesome family. Now, I choose this word fighting intentionally. And of course, we see that in verse 14 of chapter 4, the fight that Nehemiah had, the battle. He says, fight for your families, fight for your spouse, fight for, for your brothers and sisters. Okay, And it's not awesome by accident. And so... If it is by accident, then the fight becomes just average, an average fight, okay? You fight with your flesh and you win a battle. But this is not a fleshly fight. This is a spiritual battle, all right? And you have to fight for your family if you want to have a great family. You have to inject life into your family if you want a great family. Regardless of what someone has to say or doesn't say, that's not their business. Your purpose is you are the one that God has called to protect, to fight, and to watch over. And because there are all kinds of forces that are working against your family and society, all right? I want you to know that everyone on Facebook is not praying for you. I have told you before, as the body of Christ, don't put your work or your stuff out there and say to someone, pray for me. Everyone is not praying for you. Okay? You are wasting your time. When you come and the body of Christ begins to pray for you, you know somebody is praying for you. And therefore, you keep it only for the secret place. All right? And that secret place is in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't want to make a laundry mat or a list this morning, a litany of things that are working against the family today. I think we all know that. But there are definitely economic forces. There are spiritual forces. There are moral forces. There are cultural and social forces that want to destroy the idea of family, and specifically your family. So what I am much more interested this morning in looking at is the positive side, and that is how do we fight for an awesome family. Now, when the families of Jerusalem were under attack, as we read in Nehemiah chapter 4, the first thing the Spirit of the Lord said to Nehemiah, do not be afraid. Remember the Lord who is awesome. All right? Remember the Lord who is awesome. Isn't he awesome? Yeah. Everything is awesome, oh, but God. And we're looking at awesome relationships, and, to, and he continues in the verse, and fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. And fight for your homes. Now, I noticed that he didn't say fight for your husbands. You know why he didn't say that? Because you see, the husbands are supposed to watch over their households. 
They're the ones that are to be battling and to be fighting spiritually for their household. But many times they're not there. All right? And because they're not there, that means wives have to step up, daughters have to step up, sons have to step up and keep their family together. So that's why Nehemiah never, the Spirit of God never said husbands. All right, now, he's saying that your family is worth fighting for. She be all right. Don't just give up and say it can't change, it can't be different, or it's too late. It's not too late. No matter where you are on the continuum of families, starting out at a family, in the middle of a family, at the end of a, of a, of a family and moving on, such as ourselves, or helping a new family to develop. No matter where you are, folks, it's not too late to fight for your family, all right? Or to make your family better. It's never too late. You see, what I want to show with you today and to share with you is not just from God's word, but from years of counseling families. In order to help you to understand there are four traits of an awesome family, whether you are a brother or sister in the family, or whether you're a mother or father or child, or wherever you are, there are four things that makes an awesome family. Now, I'll probably just cover two today, and I'll come back to you on my next occasion, and I'll finish it off. <coughs> this is too big a subject to finish in just one sermon. It is too much to inhale. So you gotta, you got to have to give a little distance and give reflection, all right, to each person. But number one, if you're writing, awesome families are playful. Now why would I say that? Awesome families are playful. You see, in the first common denominator of great families, they know how to play. They know how to have fun. They enjoy life together. This is the missing ingredient in so many families, is that we don't know how to enjoy life. We're too busy, we're too tired, we're too negative, we're too worn out, and we're too serious. Who wants to come home from school to a place like that? Who? I know. I want to come home from work and my home feels joyful. There's joy in my home. The moment that I see Bishop Mel and she's looking a little down, I no longer become Pastor Mel, Pastor David, I become uh, David, husband. And sometimes it takes a while to get her going because something just took her day off. Completely. So folks, the average family is all work right now and no play. The last time I checked that same when I was growing up, it said it makes Jack a dull boy. Have you, have you noticed those words? Have you ever? In French and in English, I think it comes across the same. The fact is, folks, that our family is not boot camp. Parents are not drill sergeants. Your family is not a business, and parents are not CEOs. And your family is not a laboratory experiment. And you parents are not research scientists experimenting. <coughs> Let's add a little bit of this and a little bit of that and see what comes out. Well, you know what's going to come out. <coughs> we are not going to make the perfect child. Have you ever tried that? 
Don't worry. Okay. There is no perfect child. And folks, there's no perfect family. And there's no science that you can put in a little bottle and figure out how my family is going to be. The Bible has a lot to say about it. And one of the things that it has to say that families are supposed to be fun. Most people know that the Bible teaches we're supposed to work. And the Bible tells us we are to work hard. And the Bible says if we're lazy, we shouldn't even eat. Work is an important part of life. But most people don't know that the Bible says that play is an important part of life. Play is essential to adults and not just to children. In fact, play is connected to creativity. So, you have to have fun in life. Okay? Now, let me get to where the Bible says that. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 15. <coughs> Solomon says, I command the enjoyment of life. It may change in your translation. But the essential thought is, I command life to be of joy. As I said, we know that play is extremely important to development. We know that from preschoolers, and we have some individuals who uh, start with preschoolers. And preschoolers play is work. Let, let, me, let me share with those from high schools that are here. Recess is not a waste of time. Hallelujah. In fact, recess is when I become most busy at, at the school where I work. You see, recess is a time for developing as recess really is about just sitting down with a book or just taking a break from class to class. So recess is actually good for us. <clears throat> the problem is that we as adults don't recess. We don't go into recess. We always want to work. And it looks like we're working 24-7. So now we're teaching our children that all work does not require play. We don't have to get Relax. We don't have to rest. Now, Paul says in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, God generously gives us everything for our enjoyment. Just think of that for a moment. If God gives us everything for our enjoyment, why aren't we using it for our enjoyment? Because we're too busy doing all the other stuff. Do you realize that everything in the world God created, He created for us to enjoy? Everything. Listen, God wants life to be enjoyed, not merely endured. Okay, I'm enjoying life, you know. I got to get up this morning and off to work I go. Because I got bills to pay and timelines to meet and debts. So we're not enjoying life, we're just enjoying. So what happens when uh, he puts us on a flat bed? Or you, sorry, sorry, let me rephrase that. Because God doesn't put us on a flat bed. Okay? There, there, we, yes. The battles that go on inside of us put us on the flat. <laughs> but when we get there, do you realize with a bed, and it was beautiful being in a hospital for four days, that the only place you can do is look up. You can't even, you can't even lie properly on the side in one of those 
uh, th th those hospital gowns because yeah. your oh. wife your wife walks in and she said, "Excuse me, but uh, will you please cover up?" <laughs> so the only place you can lie properly and simply is looking up. There are many individuals within the sound of my voice this morning that are just enjoying life. And God desires for us to enjoy life. Now the wisest man who ever lived was Solomon. And he says that, and I recommend the command, and, and I command the enjoyment of life. Now God says everything I created is for enjoyment. If you are too busy to enjoy life, you're too busy. God meant for you to play and have some fun. Now, what does Ecclesiastes 11, 7 say? People ought to enjoy every day, not just on the weekend. Not just vacation. Ought to enjoy every day of their lives, no matter how long they live. Because life was meant to be enjoyed. So wait a minute. What does that say to me? The work that I go to or the work that I'm doing every day, I must enjoy. If I'm not enjoying it, folks, what's the use of going? What is the use of going to work and not enjoying going to work? So mothers, you wake up in a home filled with noise and kids. God is saying to you, enjoy. Enjoy. Well, how am I supposed to do that? Well, you start out in some ways that God has taught us. Share love. Share joy. Share enjoyment. And Anders wants to answer the phone. Now, it applies to you this sentence whether you're a parent or not, whether you are getting married or not, whether you have a boyfriend or not. Here's the important thing in life. People don't remember what you say, but they will remember how you made them feel. They don't remember all the stuff you say. They'll remember how you make them feel. For you in the hospital, when you walk in, that patient will remember how they feel when you were in that room. Amen. In fact, they'll look for you at every occasion. Where's so and so? Can I can I have to meet so? Oh, she's off shift. Oh, because of the way they feel. All right. Now, um, Solomon gets very specific. In the family case, he says in 9 9, Ecclesiastes 9 9, he says, Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. That's a solid statement, folks. If you can't go home and enjoy life, if you're not looking forward to getting home, I know I'm looking forward to see Bishop Mel on Monday. <laughs> and so, like, so likewise, right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no comments over there from the eldership. Dads, if you're a dad that is listening to this, the greatest gift that you can give to those children is to love their mom. Amen. Amen. All right. Here's here's the object of that. When the father shows love for the mother of the kids, it creates stability. Amen. It creates security. It creates peace in the heart of those children. When I hear couples say, we really can't afford to have fun. We can't have time to go out because of the kids. So what you are telling me is that your kids are causing you not to have fun. Really? Does that sound like 
God would give you kids so you don't have fun? I don't think so. No. So that's a serious mistake. So you see, your kids need to see you loving each other because you are the first and greatest model of the relationship they will ever see in their life. Relationships do not start at school. Relationships start at home. If you see parents just, just passing in the night and working and working and working and no real relationships, well, unfortunately that's what's going to be passed on to their kids because their children are going to think that when I get married or if I have a boyfriend, all that we need to do is work. No fun, no going out, no, no Timmy's, no McDonald's. Bible says in Psalms 127, <coughs> children are a gift from God. Amen. So if children are a gift from God, how are we going to look at those kids and say, well, the kids are, 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 you know, the kids are causing me not to have fun. That doesn't sound like a gift. All right. But maybe you are not changing your idea to understand what a gift is. Now, this message may not necessarily hit all couples because all couples don't necessarily have children, but they have families. The family is each other. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's be honest. Now, you're very honest with me, and I, you have been before. Sometimes children are a gift that you like to exchange. Yeah. <laughs> at some point or another. Yeah, yeah, at some point or another. Yeah, not there yet. <laughs> not, not there yet, but at uh, some point or another. <clears throat> you know, you feel tired. You feel drained, and you're red, yeah, you, you, you want to exchange them, okay? And I hear the mother say, no way, I'll never exchange them. Yeah, oh yeah, you think the thought. <laughs> okay, you think, you may not perform the action, but you think the thought. <laughs> That's why we have to repent all the time, because you need, you know, sometimes the words just slip out. <clears throat> I've heard fathers, you know, and this is really terrible, fathers and mothers, you know, I wish you weren't born. You know, and, and that, that's where you are at the edge over the precipice. Okay, so no longer are they gifts now. Okay, so what's the purpose? And we, we have kids that are today extremely hurt because of things that were said to them and project it into their life. So, we can think the thought. I'd like to exchange this gift, Lord. Maybe maybe you have a boy, and and you'll go and say, boy, it's, Lord, can I have a girl? Let me, let me just say, and, and uh, to you fathers out there, uh, the boys do support the moms. And the girls usually support the dads. Not always. Unfortunately. Yes. And girls tend to love their, their dads. Okay. I, I, I'm aware of that. I had one boy, and that boy always was mommy's support. All right. So, write this down. Second characteristic. Awesome families encourage growth. Well, they create an atmosphere of lifelong learning. In other words, they help each other. So, everything doesn't look the way that it should right now. But we're going to support each other. We're going to walk. We're going to encourage. Out of that comes growth. We heard it this morning in, in your word of encouragement. It's part of that support network 
that each person needs to lean on. Now, I'm not just talking about kids growing up. I'm talking about you're always growing. You see, your family never stops growing. Your mom never stops growing. Everyone always encourages mom to grow, but dad's never stopped growing either. You know, sometimes, as you know, I would like to take dads and shake them, and shake them, and shake them again. But you have got to remember one thing, probably the way that they were raised. And they're just remembering some of the stuff that they were raised and how they were taught. And so they're putting it out or manifesting it at this present time. So is mom's. Okay, so if you're not growing as children, as a family, your family life is, grow is boring. Am I correct? Okay, and why? Well, you seem to be just stuck in a rut. Home to school to home to work to home to school to home to work and all you hear is yelling and screaming. It means absolutely nothing. All right? I, I don't grow by being yelled at. Now, Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and in favor with man. Jesus. The God, man, Christ, Jesus. Grew in wisdom and stature. So, there are four kinds of growth and then I'll probably uh, wrap it up then. So let's see how we get it. Go. We are to grow in wisdom. That's intellectual growth. That's mental. We're to grow in stature. That's physical health. You grow in favor with God. That's spiritual growth. And you grow in favor with man. That's social growth. Every person in your family needs to be growing in all areas, in these four areas. Not just the kids, but mom, brother, sister, dad. You need to be growing physically, mentally, spiritually, and socially. Let me ask you a question. How are you going to be different a year from today? Do you know any more than you knew a year ago? Are you closer to God than you were a year ago? In fact, are you closer to God today than you were last week? Stop. Are you more loving? Are you literally growing? All right. Average families stay the same. But growing families, nobody changes. What do we really learn from our families? Let me repeat again. You cannot learn these skills at school or in the workplace. You only learn them at home by the Word of God. Let me tell you this. Most of our problems as adults, this is where my counseling comes in, comes from the fact that you didn't necessarily learn things correctly as a child. You saw things taking place, and because you are a child, you assume that this is correct. It hurts. It leads you into another direction. But you do not have to walk in that direction. The skill is allowing God to come in and begin to do some change work in your heart. If you didn't learn certain skills or you learned certain skills as a child, that means we can unlearn. It's the hardest, but we can all learn. 
There are five things that I want to share with you that you must learn in a family. First, one is what do I do with these feelings? One of the most important skills of life, how do I handle my emotions? What do I do with them? How do I deal with how I feel? What do you do with feelings? All right, now, you need to let people be honest and let kids express their emotions. One of the most stupid things a parent can say is stop crying, don't cry. Why? Well, there's nothing wrong with crying. In fact, the Bible said tears are a gift from God. He bottles them. All right? So if you're telling your kids to stuff their emotions, hold it inside, well, they're going to have problems with their emotions the rest of their life. There's nothing wrong with crying, folks. There's nothing to be ashamed of about crying. Telling your kids to stop crying is saying deny how you feel. Deny your emotions. Deny how you feel. Now, we can get into a whole history of that, and your kids can cry because they know they get what they want. That's a different type of crying. That I can deal with, or I can get to. But it's still their emotions. Because if you teach it, that's what they're going to produce. Am I correct? Amen. Pastor is teaching today. Now, the second skill you have to learn in a family is how to handle conflict. Do we handle conflict with our fists? Because I don't get my way, I'm going to go after you. I'm going to beat up somebody. Is that the way we handle conflict? No. Okay. Now, <coughs> If you don't know how to handle conflict in your family, listen to this very carefully, you're going to have problems in your relationships. Nobody taught you the skill on how to resolve or clarify conflict. If kids don't see their parents working problems out in front of them and showing this is how we deal when we have differences. Did you know that you're a man and a woman, you will have differences? You know, this thought that people have in their mind that somehow or other you're going to meet the one and you're going to be compatible. Where, where? There's only compatibility in one area, and that is how you serve the Lord. But compatibility, don't look for it. You're two different people. What do they call it? Venus and uh, Mars? You're two different planets. And that's why in my counseling to married couples, I usually take the lady through what a man goes through. Because maybe she doesn't understand. And I do it vice versa. I take the man through and say, wait a minute. You have to know how this woman is going to feel. One day you get home, you'll see her broken down and in tears, and you're going to want to fix it. This is not Mr. Fix-It. This is just understanding emotions. Okay? I heard that laugh back there. What happens is most people in conflict become either mute or martyr, or they become a maniac. They're either holding it in, and one day, poof, it explodes. Everybody, if you don't learn how to deal with conflict, you tend to become either one of two animals, a skunk or a turtle. You understand a skunk? What does a skunk do? 
Yeah. When they're upset, they let everybody know. They stink up the place. And they spray. And everybody knows he's ticked off. What does a turtle do? Pulls into their shell and isolates themselves and pulls back out of fear of conflict. So there are two animals. Interested. Now let me share with you, skunks will always marry turtles. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. Because two skunks, mm, it doesn't care. They both stay up the space, right? So, two turtles? Okay. So, I have always seen that. Now, I don't tell people when they're counseling, you're the skunk and you're the turtle. I don't go that there. I, I, I wouldn't go there. But I'm just kind of putting that thought in your mind. Skunks always marry turtles. Now, <laughs> one of you is a skunk and one of you is a turtle in your marriage. <laughs> it's true in every single marriage. One of you is the aggressor and one of you pulls back. And neither of these is the godly approach. <laughs> neither is correct. So neither of you get the quote higher, higher model ground. Oh, I'm a skunk, I'm better than you. Or I'm a turtle, I'm better than you. No. They're both ineffective ways to deal with conflict. All right? Third thing, and a really big thing, is that you have to learn in a family how to handle loss. I'm speaking from experience of loss. Because why? In your life, there's going to be a lot of losses. You see, you're going to have big losses, you're going to have small losses, and you've got to teach kids and even parents have to learn how to grieve a loss. Nobody wins all the time. Did we know that? We go out and play soccer. We go out and play a cricket match or baseball game or softball game. And some or other parents say, you are expected to win our hockey game. Well, how about just going out and having fun, kids? If you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. But you turn around and you tell your kids, or you start as we see in, in what's happening in kids hockey, they beat up the coach. Or the coach has a certain punishment for kids that lose and the parents get involved. Well, either one of two things, either shut your mouth and allow the kid to be coached, because you are not going to be part of that kid's life their whole life. At some point in time, they're going to hit a loss. But what are they going to do? Run to mommy? Oh, sorry. Do we run to mommy? Allow the kid to go through an experience law. It's not going to kill them. Failure would not destroy you. A loss wouldn't be the end of your life because you don't win anything. I would love to tell you this morning that I would have loved to have won my first wife and my first boy. The very two things that I asked God for and the very two things he decides, I'm going to take them from you. Why? Because are you going to serve me if they're lost? That's what he's telling me. 
or am I going to quit? Like many of my fellow pastors, many of them have said, why don't you just give up? <coughs> well, am I serving the Lord, or am I serving what he gives to me? Are we serving the creator, or are we serving the creation? So you must learn to deal with losses. We must know how to grieve. The fact is in life, folks, that some things actually take you up and you're going to have real successes in life. But don't get full of pride because the moment that you get full of pride and you get full of ego, the next roll. Now, I don't know if you know a game. There, there's two games. There's chucks and ladders or there's snakes and ladders. All right. So you're playing the game snakes and ladders. You roll the dice and you go up the ladder. You know the long one? Yeah. Right. And you're all happy because you're way out ahead of everybody else. Roll the dice. Here comes the snake. Boom. Sometimes you're ahead of everybody else. But all it takes is two rolls, and you realize you're not ahead. You're way down in the bottom. And you're hoping the roll comes around, and you get, you. oh, there's a ladder coming up. You roll, you go one past the ladder. And you're sitting down, and you say, what happened? What? what? It's because you got your little full self of pride when you hit the first ladder and you went up. You see, you got all prideful. Well, you see, that happens in life, folks. We get all prideful when something good happens. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That's life. That's the way that life is. And you have to teach your children that there are going to be ups and downs. Not everything is going to be on the up and up. So a game like Snakes and Ladders is a good teaching uh, board game. Okay? Some people never learn to take their turn. That's the problem. All right, you see them on the freeway, don't you? You're driving on the freeway, you're doing 110. And the guy comes by you doing 130. Yeah. And you know what is my pet peeve? They cut in front of you with no any signal. Yeah. I said, maybe the signal doesn't work on that car. Maybe when they taught them how to drive, they didn't teach them how to use the signal. Because can you define by telling the driver behind you, I'm about to pull over in your lane? Is that something wrong with that? But you understand that how that person was taught is vital and important. I know how they were taught just by their lack of use of the signal. Now, write this down. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. The Bible says, even if good people fall seven times, they'll get back up again. I love that verse. You know why? Because it says, even good people fall. The word actually in Hebrew means righteous. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. So even when good people fall, even the best people, the well-intentioned people, they stumble, they mess up, they say the wrong things, they do the wrong things. We all fall, we all stumble, and we all mess up. Have you ever, as a, as a mother, put your kid on a bicycle? No. And you see them, and you, you see how they ride the bike, and they're, they're you, you remember, yeah, right? And, and they're, you know, 
I, I told you the story about me learning to ride a bicycle, my first bicycle, and I was so good at it, you know, and I start to pedal, and I pedal so fast that I forgot there was a corner coming up, and instead of hitting the corner, I went straight in what we call the couscous grass. And the couscous grass has blades at the end of it. And I came out all cut up, crying, <laughs> I never want to ride a bicycle again. Well, I tell you, it didn't stop me from learning how to ride a bicycle again. The next day I was with my cuts, learning how to turn a corner at a slower speed. So do you remember your child in the first soccer game? No. But they come out not victorious. And you teach your child, you got to be victorious at everything you do. That's what the world does. So they're teaching their kid that they cannot lose. So the first time their kids lose, man, they go home and they're all ashamed because I lost. That's not how we teach our kids. That's not what the Bible says. We're going to have ups and up and downs in life. And in teaching a child resilience to keep getting back up. If I did not get back up after that bike, Okay, I would not learn, have learned how to ride a bicycle. And even as a, as, a, at my age, I can still get on a bicycle and know I can ride it. Because that day after that fall, I got back up. Okay, the fourth thing, and I'm coming to an end, folks, is that we learn from our families, is that we learn what values matters the most. You have to help your children to understand what is important. Would you agree that the world is teaching our kids values that aren't very good? I would agree. All around us, the world is teaching our kids values that we don't necessarily agree with. Yes. The world teaches that all that matters is looks. <clears throat> How you look on the outside. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what your character is, as long as you look good on the outside. The world teaches that the more money you have, the more important you are, the more successful, the more fulfilled. They lie, they lie, they lie. The more the world teaches that the more you can get people to praise you or take off like on your Facebook page, the more valuable you are. True? Really? Our kids are learning a lot of values from movies, from videos, from songs, from their friends. All the things that are not true. So the only good things you can say about Satan this morning is that he is predictable. Amen. Do you know the devil doesn't have any new temptations? <laughs> he will tempt you with the same thing. Listen, there's a study that's going on. We're, we're kind of throwing it around in our studies. But we said to the, each other, including our local study, is... Take, take a look sometimes at the Word of God and see what tempted Satan. Satan had nothing to be tempted by. You know what was his downfall? Pride. What's usually our downfall? Pride. The Bible calls them three temptations. Lust of the flesh, Lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We were known by our status. We were known by how much we make. And basically saying that life is about three things. Getting all the good things you can. What I possess having all the pleasure you want, regardless of how it hurts other people. 
passion and becoming important and having status. So those are the three temptations. Last but not least this morning, we learn our families good habits. Because why? Habits determine our character. Now if one of the marks of an awesome family <coughs> is that we help each other to grow, how do you do that? How do you help mom to grow? How do you help your, your, your brothers and sisters to grow? How do you help your nephews and nieces to grow? Let me give you two ways and I'm done. By example. By example. Your example. How you respond in the midst of something that you just don't like. Through your conversation. Critical conversations. If you're not having conversations with your kids about real issues, they're not growing. It hurts my heart when I go to a funeral and I see parents hiding their kids from the deceased. What am I teaching my kids? That death is not part of life? You don't have to look at that. You don't have to see it if you know. Here is what life is and here is what death is. Teach them. Talk to them. The more we try to keep them away from, is the more dangerous it will become as a world to them. Because they will apply the wrong principles and the wrong character. And I'm done. Lily? Thank you so much.